Welcome back to page 121. Today we're going to take a look at a nice little offering for Mongoose Traveler, Sword Worlds. This came out in 2020. It's by written by Martin Doherty. I, I've enjoyed this book. Uh, I, I, it took a little while to read through, which is a good problem they have. It's, it's got a lot of info in here. So we're going to take a look at it and uh, just see what this book brings to the table and uh, how it feels a little different than your standard uh, book about some section of the Imperium. And I always like that about Travelers. So we're going to talk about that a little bit in here. I'm also going to mention that this is available as part of a bundle of holding that's going on now through about November 28th. Uh, so I'll attach a link to that too. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the video. I also want to mention subscribers. Hey, always looking for them. Always grabbing for them. Hey, what can I say? Want to grow the channel. So thank you very much for everybody who subscribed. You guys are great. Let's keep the channel growing. Uh, I'm looking for new subscribers, but I'm also looking for ideas. If you have any ideas of videos and maybe something I should take a look at or uh, an aspect of one of the games I cover that you've loved or something like that, let me know. Uh, constructive criticism too, always welcome. So I usually said at the end of the video, I thought I'd throw it early this time. Also, I have Patreon going, so if you can take a look at that, there will be a link below for that. Uh, anything you can do to help out the Patreon so I can help grow the channel that way too would be much appreciated. But back to, back to today's topic, Sword Worlds for Traveler from Mongoose on page 121. All right, the Sword Worlders, Vikings in Space. What's that to love about Vikings, Vikings in Space, by the way? Uh, I, Silent Death always had Vikings in Space. Uh, I've always loved the Sword Worlds. I always thought Silent Death took their Vikings in Space from the Sword Worlds. But uh, the Sword Worlds, a neat little chunk of space in the Spinward Marches uh, on the fringe of Imperial territory. And uh, kind of, unfortunately for them, sandwiched between the Zodani, the Imperium, and the Darians, which uh, leaves it a little tough for them to, to maintain their independence and their own identity. And that's really a lot of what this book deals with. This book, as I said, was published in 2020 by Martin Doherty, uh, written by Martin J. Doherty. Uh, it's a nice book. I, I enjoyed reading this. Uh, one thing I've always loved about Traveler is when you have a political entity that is not part of the Imperium. I like reading up on that because it's still Traveler. It's still got all that good Traveler flavor, but it's not just the Imperium. You're not just locked in there. So this book brought a lot to the table. Nice little intro and historical perspective. The, uh, the uh, Sword Worlds were founded by some Terrans that were fleeing oppression and aboard a group sh uh, ship called the, the Gram. And then they landed in this link of beautiful uh, Jump One connected worlds, a nice little main there. And uh, all were suitable for human habit habitation. So what a strange thing. Could this have been something the ancients did? And it, uh, we get a lot of information on the colonization and expansion of the territories. And then we get a lot of the political history. I love the political history of places like uh, the Sword Worlds, simply because you can add that flavor to your game. Here we have the Sword Worlds, their, their uh, subsector, and then District 268 would just be rimward of that. And then uh, we they stick a little bit out into there. Darians are over here, Sedani are up here, Imperiums over here, and I think over here also. So it's pretty interesting. They're they're surrounded on all sides, but they are maintaining their own political existence. Um, they are not without controversy. These guys will pick a fight, but they'll pick a fight because they need to, not because they want to. The uh, the stereotype of the sword worlders, the men, is that they're these bellicose blowhards who are going to pick a fight no matter what and always find a way to have their honor uh, impugned so they can go ahead and they can they can get into a brawl with somebody. Well, this book shows that's not that couldn't be farther from the truth. They're all reasonable individuals who do worry about their own personal honor, but they'll ignore a slight until it's not able to be ignored any longer. And that's what a lot of uh, this book deals with is who the sword worlders are, why they act the way they act. And then the other thing that is common about the sword worlders is their treatment of women. Women are just chattel, the outsiders say. They don't have any rights or anything. They're, they're just kept home to, to propagate this, this species. Well, no. The 
women in the sword worlds are valued as important members of the of society, but really as important as the raisers of the families, the ones that will keep the race going. The men can go out and take the dangerous jobs. The women need to stay home where it's safe. And it's kind of neat because this book goes out of its way to point out that the women who are raised in the sword worlds don't really have an issue with this. They have opportunities. They can go take dangerous jobs. But their primary societal function is to have babies and, and propagate the, the sword, world, sword world species, human if you want, and to keep the family safe and strong. So they serve as big a function as the men do. And in many functions, women can go ahead. You can have women who become operatives in the Navy and such. It's just that they face a little uh, tougher opposition than women in the Imperium would find. So we get various looks at the sword worlds throughout their history. Uh, great history. Now we get a look at the money, money in the sword worlds and their law. Their law is kind of neat. Their law is basically you owe society something because you damaged something of society. You injured a member of this society. You caused physical damage of property. You swindled something. So we're going to put you to work, and you're going to work off your debt, the debt you've created to society. They're not just going to incarcerate you for incarceration's sake. You're going to be incarcerated toward an end of paying back to make recompense for what you've done. Pretty interesting idea. Uh, in theory, that would be great. I don't know practicality, what we're talking about, but I like the idea and I like reading about it. And then they talk about uh, how your social standing can change as you go down in uh, society as you create, as you commit crimes. If you become an outlaw, you're the lowest of the low, equating to social one, you can't hold property. Uh, you can also be exiled from uh, the sword worlds. If you are exiled, depending on the level of your crime and the level of exile that you've suffered, it might be legal for anyone to just come up and just end you. And they would suffer no social or legal repercussions for that because you were just an it. You didn't really belong to society anymore. So kind of neat. Religion is dealt with here, and I was a little surprised here. I was expecting a lot of Thor and Oda worship. And there's plenty of talk of Thor and Odin throughout this book. But the worship isn't there. They revere these as wonderful stories from the past. And some people have tried to make it into a religion. Azerism. Uh, but by and large, they're not regarded as, as historical figures or religious icons. They're simply stories to draw inspiration for your life. I kind of like that. I was a little surprised about that, honestly. Uh, and we go into the various government types that they have within the sword worlds. And this is where it differentiates from uh, the Imperium. Uh, and I like that. You've got uh, no governance at, at lo level zero. You've got corporate at code one. Code two is participating democracy. Code three is an oligarchy. Code four, representative democracy. Code five, feudal technocracy. Code, uh, that's code six. Code seven, balkanization. And there is a lot of balkanization in the sword worlds. There, some of the governments are fragmented, and a lot of the planetary governments are fragmented. Uh, code 8 is civil service bureaucracy, and Code 9 is impersonal bureaucracy. So it's kind of neat that they, they have their own little setup on the, the various uh, law codes. Uh, and then we go into the commerce and infrastructure. And then we talk about exiles, outlaws, and refugees. Oddly enough, refugees, depending on where... Why they became refugees in the first place may or may not be accorded uh, help from various sword world worlds. If you are a refugee from a government that's been overtaken, then the government that defeated the other government needs to take you in and take care of you. If, however, you are refugees just fleeing an oppressive situation, if nobody wants to take you in, you're kind of on your own. Uh, that can be a bad situation. And now we go take a look at the sword world confederation itself. And how it's dealing with its neighbors. And basically it's a political fist fight most of the time in the sword worlds. They're closer to the Vargir in their political system than they would be to the Imperium. In that a charismatic leader can rise to the top and he can lead and he can bluff and bluster and even blunder and stay in power as long as he stays true to whatever it is that he is espoused as being true. If he betrays the truth that he's been talking about, that becomes a problem. 
and he can fall from power. So it was funny because it reminded me a lot of the Vargir, the way their charisma works, that they have to stay charismatic and as pack leaders, basically. You have much the same here with humans. And then we go into the military and the paramilitary forces. This was really neat. Their various war plans were really neat. They know that they are technologically inferior to the Darians, the Zodani, and the Imperium. The main one they worry about is the Imperium. They know that the Imperium could beat them in a moment in a battle, or in a war, rather, and just conquer them. So their strategy is to make it so expensive to be conquered that nobody's willing to pay that price. To that end, they have a um, Jump 1 fleet, but it's massive, and they, they keep it Jump 1 because it's cheaper, but then they can move the fleet around and attack here or there as a massive group and strike a blow, and then they can try to fade away while you're reacting to the initial blow, or they can fake you out by giving you disinformation that their fleet is here when it's really here. So it's pretty neat. I, I like that, and it was some kind of a good look at some uh, political tactics, if you will. Then we go into the Interstellar Patrol, and its performance uh, basically is a, a peacekeeping kind of mission. And then we have the ranks in the patrol, the various starships. Then we have the Di Diplomatic Corps, which was pretty neat. And then the Scientific Corps, which again surprised me. Scientific Corps is very dedicated and their first priority is to grab other tech and then uh, reverse engineer it so it's usable for the sword world. Second is new tech and exploration. I thought that was an interesting twist. Most scientific communities would be looking for new tech. These guys are just trying, trying to figure out a way to gain parity with the various foes that surround them. Then we get the mercantile surface, service, which can also be drafted into the... Uh, basically the Navy at need, and kind of become a merchant marine. That was pretty cool. Naval forces, now they talk about the various fleets, and the fleets are based out of various planets within the Sword World. So you got the Tizon fleet, the Joyous fleet, Graham, Sacknoth, Narsil. And it's nice, too, because uh, they acknowledge the origins like Narsil. They say right out, the world name comes from the works of J.R.R. Tolkien. For a long time in Traveler, there was kind of a, a you know, smirk behind the hand, giggle kind of thing going with the sword worlds where they were saying, well, yeah, that's from Lord of the Rings and that's from Earth Legend, but so what? Well, this book just kind of takes it and runs with it. And I like that. They, they talk about how the various worlds feel about being named for Sting or, or for uh, Excalibur and if it's important to them or not is part of their social identity. And that was another aspect I hadn't really considered coming into this book. We go into various command areas. Uh, each larger area, the command area, uh, has some of the fleets that it can direct, but the fleets are commanded by their individual uh, fleet commanders, so it's it's kind of a mishmash reaction force. Uh, and then we go into tactical formations, and then the, the whoops, there are warships, and then we go into other ship types. And we got some nice artwork in this book. I, I this was a nice presentation. And I got to tell you, I, I kept finding surprises in various pages, and that was really good for, for me, for my enjoyment of the book. I have read other Sword Worlds books for years in Traveler, and I was expecting kind of a, okay, this is just a rehash of more, and it's just kind of, okay, this is how it was done, and this it's just an expansion of other books. And there's certainly aspects of that here, but there's enough original and new stuff and new take on stuff that makes me glad I read it. Again, when I used to have the old, uh, oh, I have the old stuff, I don't need the new Mongoose stuff. I'm seeing now, yeah, I do need the new Mongoose stuff. They bring a nice, fresh twist to a lot of this stuff that enhances some of the older stuff. After reading this, I cracked out a couple of my older treatments of Sword Worlds and just kind of compared the two. And uh, I like this one. This one's uh, got a much more modern flavor to it. Um, it's just better overall. So then we have uh, how the fleets have offensive operations, their raiding operations. A lot of what the sword worlds will do is essentially commerce raiding. They'll is part of making it too expensive for you to conquer them. They'll go in and they'll hit your commerce behind your lines or try to attack your supply lines and make it as difficult as possible for you to pin them down and hold them in a straight up fight. Instead, they'll they'll strike where you're weakest and then try to fade away. Interesting set of tactics for an inferior foe to use. Uh, then we have the naval, look at the naval ranks. 
more great artwork. Now we go to the ground forces, the army kind of, and most of these are analogous to what's in the Traveler Corps rulebook. So these don't get their own separate Sword World flavored treatment, which I thought was good too, because I was reading these and I was kind of going, okay, we're going to get a, a bunch of different things brought out for the scientist cast and things like that, that are really covered in the core rulebook. They didn't do that. We only have one Sword World career, and I'll get to that in a moment. So we're, we're still going through ground forces, and now we got a nice breakdown of how the ground forces operate. Uh, battalions, uh, divisions, brigades. It's I love this book. Uh, maritime and aerospace forces. Yes, we have waterborne forces and, and air-breathing uh, fighting vehicles. They're brought out here. It's only a few pa paragraphs, but they're there. And then we get the ranks, and then we get the sword worlds and associated star systems. And it kind of gives a little breakdown of each of the power groups. And it does it by showing the individual power group layout in their own little area, which is pretty neat. And then I keep going through all that. This is a pretty long section, which I enjoyed immensely. Nice artwork again. We keep going. We got to look at the star ports that they have in each of these, which is kind of nice too, because it's, again, it's not the Imperium. I run in District 268, which is not Imperium space. So I'm always looking for something that's going to be Okay, the Imperium's over here, but it's got its own flavor. Each of these star bases are not Imperial star bases, so the different law levels are the, the law levels are very different than in, inside the Imperium, where a, a downport is Imperial territory. Here it's Sword World territory, but they may have decided to leave it subject to the planetary government. So the entire planet, including the downport, might have the same laws. It might be illegal for you to carry a gun there. It's just interesting. And then we keep going through the various uh, planets and their various alliances. This, like I say, is a good chunk of the book, but that's that's okay by me. Gotta get that. There we go. And we go to the metal worlds are the last. I think they're the last ones. And it's kind of neat too because they're not all truly sword worlds anymore. You've got Mjolnir, uh, named for Thor's hammer, and a few others. Gungur, Gung, Gungnir, Odin's uh, spear. Uh, I just thought that was a nice touch. And then we come to, we're still going through it, Secrets of the Sword Worlds. I'm going to kind of blow past this because there's some kind of cool things in there. And I don't really want to do spoilers on that. But there's some neat little Secrets of the Sword Worlds in there. How they're trying to deal with... Uh, the Darien Star Trigger and things like that. Uh, it's, it's definitely worth reading, and I didn't want to give up spoilers there. Now we get to Sword World Travelers. How are you a traveler in the Sword World? And again, Psionics and Cybernetics. How do they feel about them? Well, they don't like Psionics very much. They don't like the idea of you having something that was given to you as a, a, birth, a gift at birth rather than earning it, which makes me scratch my head a little because if a man is has grown to be a very large man and has great strength and can use that strength to his advantage, that's a gift of birth also. So I, I thought that was a little dichotomy here uh, between physical gifts and psionic gifts. And uh, it was interesting. Cybernetics are not viewed favorably either. You should stand on your own two feet, if you, is, if you will. And then we get down to the patrol. And this is the career that they call out in this book is for the patrol. This is kind of the uh, security force for the sword world uh, and it's got the three different branches you, you can be in it's just I liked it it was what I was expecting having read a few of these books now but it was not uh, one of many and I thought there would be and you get the various uh, event tables mishap tables mustering out benefits and then we go to just Jane's guide to spacecraft of the sword worlds and we get a nice look at the sword world ships and it's interesting because these are basically ten, tech level 10 and 12 ships that they're able to field. They're not able to do uh, anything on the par of tech level 13 or 14 or 15. So their they're, rank and file are in tech level tel, 10 to 12 ships. And that was pretty neat too. The orbital mines. I like the idea of, of mining a gas giant to make it hazardous for your enemy to refuel. And then we go to the small craft. It's just individual fighters. 
takes the pictures a moment to catch up on this. I apologize. And then I'm just going to kind of blow through this section just to show what's in the book. Ah, come on. There we go. I'll try shrinking it a little bit each time. And now we're going to get down to spacecraft. Come on, let's get the last one. It's not going to load. Uh, high guard spacecraft. I'm going to drop out of this section. It's just not loading properly. It does when I read it. It's just not loading here for whatever reason. There we go. Like strike boat. Just having some technical glitches today. So the base, the rest of the book is the various ships. And this goes on for several pages as well. We get about uh, 40, 45 pages of ships. Uh, I thought that was pretty cool. We get defense platform. We get all kinds of goodies in here. This book is available, obviously, through Mongoose's website. It's also available through Drive-Thru RPG. It's currently in, in uh, something, uh, there's a, a website out there called Bundle of Holding. And every once in a while, they'll collaborate with publishers and they'll say, hey, can we put together a Bundle of hold Holding? And it would be a bunch of these different books and we'll lump them together. Sword Worlds is in one of these and uh, it's, it's a nice setup. There's two going on right now for Traveler. They go through, I think, November 28th. I'll attach a link below to both. But... Uh, Tremendous value for around, I think uh, the price right now is around $37. The price goes up a little bit as they buy. I'm not positive how it bundled holding works. If anybody wants to kind of bring me into the loop on that, I bought a few things from them over the time, and I like what they do. Uh, I just don't understand exactly how the price increases and things like that. But this is uh, set up then when you buy this stuff through bundled holding, it becomes part of your archive on DriveThruRPG. They'll send you a link for all the stuff that you've downloaded, and then that becomes uh, st stuff that shows that you've bought it on Drive Through RPG, which is pretty nice. You can get a lot of books about the Spinward Marches, and then there's another one about the uh, uh, Rift ex Exploration and that kind of stuff, uh, the Deep Night Endeavor and that kind of stuff, with a bunch of the adventures attached and everything. And I want to say they're around $37 of right now uh, to get the, the big package. So definitely worth taking a look at. I'll attach links below. So that's all I've got to say today on page 121. I hope you like this brief, if, if somewhat truncated, look at the, uh, the PDF. This is definitely not anything to do with the PDF itself. It's absolutely my tablet. My tablet's been giving me fits the last few days. I'm not really sure why. But the, uh, the PDF worked great when I was reading it. So I absolutely recommend it. Take a look. And, of course, these books are available for hard copy, too, through Mongoose. So you can take a look at those there, too. I'll, I'll put a link to the Sword World's book through Mongoose and then the uh, Bundle of Holdings. So that's all I've got to say today on page 121. Thanks for watching. Please remember to subscribe, like the video, and uh, remember the Patreon. Thank you for your time, and I'll see you next time on page 121.